Welcome to Birdland Media Works. I'm your host, Danielle Pai. And today I'm airing the special episode of Discernment Radio, featuring co host Cindy Reednauer and myself as we discuss the publishing world and the creative writing process. Thank you for joining us. Well, Happy New Year, Cindy. Well, Happy New Year to you, too. <laughs> 2020, it's been a while since we uh, actually sat behind the mic. It has. And, you know, I've been hearing a lot of people saying that it's the start of a new decade, and other people are saying, no, 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 it's just the end of the last decade. So what do you think? I think that 2021 is officially the start of the new decade. Okay. But I prefer simplicity. So I'm all for saying that this is the start of it. Okay. (laughs) Well, what do I you like, think? I like the idea that, that there's a lot of change in the works. That's what I like. I gotcha. <laughs> so, yeah, there's definitely things on the move. And actually, that brings us to today's topic. Um, I've been working on a book, and Cindy, thank you so much for your help. So I have a sci-fi novel in the works. And in the past, I've done some children's yoga books. I've uh, been a contributing author and, and a journalist for many years. But this one is a little bit different than some things in the past. And just to kind of set the stage, when I wrote my first kids book, and this was back in 2010, everybody said, well, if you self-publish, you're not a quote-unquote real author. And I had published through my business, Birdland Media Works, as an indie press. And my feeling at the time, and still is today, I don't really care if somebody considers me a quote-unquote real author, as long as they're buying my book and like it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, and that's changed a lot, because now everybody you talk to is writing and publishing a book. Yes. So what I was hoping, Cindy, I thought this was a great opportunity. So, Cindy, you being a book publisher and an editor and knowing the ins and outs of book marketing uh, in many different levels, if you could shed some insight. So for this book, I came to Cindy and I said, you know, I would like to give this one a shot to pitch to you know, traditional press. And Cindy gave me the rundown about the different options that are out there that people might not be aware of. So, Cindy, could you talk a little bit about the publishing world as it is today? Well, it's changed so much, especially over the last 10 years. And traditional publishers were the mainstay of publishing 10 years ago. Everybody wanted to be with a big publisher. And the image was that they would put you on whirlwind book tours. They would get you in all the bookstores and they would make you a lot of money. Well, a lot of them have gone out of business. The model has changed so that now if you self-publish, you can possibly make more money that way, especially with the ebook portion of it. Mm -hmm. And they do different things, such as if your book is in a bookstore, you don't get your royalties until the bookstores have the option to take books back. So normally a bookstore will take two copies of a new book And if those don't sell within six months, then the copies are returned and they get credit for it. Well, that comes out of your portion of royalties or any other books that you've sold. So that's a little bit different. If you're just putting your book up on Amazon or putting it through a distributor like Ingram, you could be online around the world and anybody that carries Ingram products. Okay, so just to break it down a little bit. Now, unless you are a very well-known author, like a Stephen King of the right. world, you know, for, for the average person publishing a book, let's assume a traditional press picks them up and said, hey, first-time author, or maybe it wouldn't be, it'd be a smaller press, and they pick yes, them up. Yes, a smaller press. Mm-hmm. What would they expect? You talked a little bit about, like, they're, they're kind of tied up a little bit. What's the pros and cons of a traditional press? Well, a traditional press, the big ones, are probably only going to go after big names. You have to be famous. You have to be well-known. You have to have a hook. You have to have been in the news. You have to have some reason why they're going to back you. And even if you do get lucky enough to be taken on by a traditional press, a lot of times they expect you to still do the work. You need to have a large social media following. You might need to back your own book tours. So you have to have some kind of vested effort in your time and even money to be picked up. Smaller presses, they still look for new authors, and they may not have all the financial backing behind them that a traditional press does, but they have the experience. And that's what you need as a first-time author or somebody who's 
you know, maybe self-published before. They can help you with connections. They can help you with the marketing. But you still have to have some reason that they want to take you on. Yeah, and it sounds like a middle ground. So you might get some small advance from them. You might get royalties. They might, I would think, take on some of the responsibility of advertising and marketing. But mm-hmm. it, from what I understood from what you told me, it's a little more of a collaborative. They're not going to do everything. You still have to right. participate. Right, right. So we've gotten the the main traditional press, the smaller press, and Can you talk a little bit about Indie Press, which is what you do, and Mm -hmm. how the pros and cons of that as well? Mm -hmm. Well, basically, when you're doing it yourself, you're finding somebody like me who knows how to format the book, so you know how Ingram expects it to be, they used to use the term typeset, but now it's formatted, but as far as making sure that your fonts are embedded and everything is checked out so that a printer reads the file and everything prints correctly. As far as an ebook goes, you have to know exactly how to format that. You need to know about ISBN numbers. You need to know about Library of Congress numbers and have the regular publishing knowledge. And that's why you'd go to an indie publisher. Gotcha. And and people already, I can kind of hear them on the other end, like their head is spinning. Because <laughs> when, when I was first experienced to this, it was like one thing after another. They're like, I have to do that now. Now I have to do that. Um, and you realize you do need support. It's, mm-hmm. And I know too many authors who think the book's done. You know, where's my spot on Oprah? Where's Oprah? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've heard that so many times. <laughs> and they, I, I, and once you start to tell them, well, this is what needs to happen. Like, you, okay, you wrote the book. You're 10% there. Now here's the next 90% while you market it. That's right. You know, so... Um, can you give them, you, you touched on it a little bit, so somebody has a book that they've written, it's done. What would be the first recommendation as far as they're handing it to you or an editor? What's the first part of the process? First off, you definitely need a well-edited book. People are brutal when it comes down to their reviews online, and you don't want to risk that because you can get a negative review just because they don't like it. You can get a negative review because they didn't get their shipment in time. But you can't take down a review. I got got star taken off because the book arrived with the cover bent, and I had nothing to do with that. Isn't that frustrating? (laughs) I'm sorry, reader number 37. (laughs) I know, that's so tough to have to deal with. But so what you want to do is make sure you control everything that you can control which is editing, formatting, making sure that the book is appealing. A cover makes such a big difference, a nice cover. You have to think about when you're looking on Amazon, who has 80% of the book business, you have to compete against hundreds, if not thousands, of other books that just have a little one-inch thumbnail. So how are you going to stand out? Yeah. And nowadays, because of the way Amazon does the books, I can sometimes search for an author and the book name, and it will not be the first one that pops up. So Amazon is using their own algorithms to say, oh, no, I think you might actually like this book. Even (laughs) though you actually match the title and the author, they will say that you might like this book better. And I'll have to search three pages down just to find the actual book I was searching for. So there's just so many differences nowadays, and there's a lot of people that advertise on Amazon. You know, those sponsored ads that you see below a book that you're searching for that pops up. People are paying for that. They're bidding on keywords to be able to pop up before somebody else does. Yeah, and there's a couple of really good things you mentioned in there. Uh, number one, the uh, I know too many people who want to self-edit. Now, I work as an editor, Mm -hmm. and I've edited for other people. I would not touch my own work because your brain is going to autocorrect. It does. And you're you're going to read it the way you think it should be. Um, The other thing I did, in addition to two editors, you have your main edit and your proofing, and I was open to even developmental editing if the reviews came back with my test readers that more was needed. And that Mm -hmm. was the other thing. We had you know, you and some other people as test readers to say, here's what was confusing, here's what didn't make sense about this, so I could go and do a rewrite. And so a lot of people write a book, they don't take the reviews, they're they're worried about the reviews after it's out there, but 
get a little feedback to start with. It's no guarantee that everybody's going to love it because you're not going to please right. everybody. But we did the test readers. We did the editing. I hired uh, Joan Peters to do the cover, and I actually changed the color based on your feedback saying, hey, if you're looking at a thumbnail, what's going to pop out? Right, right. So, and then on the marketing end, you know, um, there's a lot that actually warrants like more <laughs> episodes and what we can cover here. So they have the book, it's ready to go. Um, assuming they're gonna go indie press and publish mm -hmm. on their own, what kind of financial investment? Is it very scalable as far as what they need to do to market and get it out there? Well, the marketing is pretty much anything you can do for free all the way up to paying thousands of dollars depending on what you wanna do. Um, one of the great things if you have also produced an ebook is to use Amazon's KDP Select. And what that means is that for 90 days, you're giving the ebook version exclusivity to Amazon. And then for five of those days, you're either going to give it away for free or at a discounted rate. And by doing that, and that's free, you don't have to pay to do that. And by doing that, there's a whole lot of websites and bloggers who have massive email lists of people who want to know when a book is free. So you can take out a small ad with them or tweets, whatever they have to sell to show to their list. And some of these lists can be 400,000, a million people. And as I've been in publishing longer, I'm seeing more and more of these sites with massive lists. So for $30, $59, $75, you may be able to take out an ad with them, and then they're going to see that your book is free. Now, a lot of people will say, I don't want to give my book away for free. I want to sell it. But you need reviews. So say you have a 1,000 downloads of a free book. Maybe you're going to get 10 reviews, if you're lucky, because people just don't make the effort. Yeah. But you at least have that possibility. You also have the possibility of people starting to talk about it on social media. So if you have a good book or you have something very different or unusual or a hook that people don't see all the time, then you have a great option doing KDP Select. Yeah, and you put me onto something that I did not realize. Um, as somebody who ignores her own Twitter page in favor of monitoring everybody else's for, for work, mm -hmm. um, I, I was just never that interested in it. And here you are saying that if you're pitching, say, to a traditional press, say, um, they want to know that you have a following. And right. that, that helps, of course, with, with indie press as well. But to be able to show people, I have 50,000 people who are following this. I have, you know, this book in the works. And I would think that they want to know that you have something else in the works. Right. So share with us a success story before before mine gets out there and hopefully is the, <laughs> <laughs> is the biggest success story. <laughs> Well, I have one author I've worked with. He's got five picture books out, and his latest book is geared more towards middle school, high school, young adult. The book's name is Ricardo's Extraordinary Journey, A Boy's Mystical Quest for Fame, Fortune, and Adventure. It's an adventure book about a 15-year-old in the 14th century, and he encounters all sorts of famous characters and actually gets to experience history, kind of think about like Forrest Gump meets Harry Potter in mm -hmm. a way. And it's well written, it's quite an adventure. And then at the end of the book, he also did extensive appendices of all the foods, the international foods that were featured, the locations, uh, the Silk Road, so that if a middle schooler or high schooler needed to write a book report, this would be perfect because wow. they could be referring to all yeah. this great information in the back of the book and they could create a great report on that. But one of the things we did was we found categories that were very particular to this book. And by finding a category that really zeroes in on the book, that ranked him so much higher than having to compete in, say, children's fiction, yeah. which is a wide, wide, wide with millions of people in it. So that was able to get attention of people quickly. And so we used that as part of our marketing campaign. And then we also used sponsored ads with Amazon. And these sponsored ads allow you to bid on keywords against other authors. 
you can set the amount you want to spend per day, the amount you're willing to pay per click, and you give Amazon a list of the keywords. And what we did was we researched authors in that age group that would be similar, such as Diary of a Wimpy Kid or Harry Potter and Chris Colfer, who is a famous author Mm -hmm. now who used to be on The Glee Show. Mm -hmm. And so if you have people searching for those terms, then you're going to pay money to put your sponsored ad underneath where that book shows up. And hopefully they'll click on it and buy it. And we have been seeing a lot of success. We've seen that he has appeared over 2 million times on searches and that what they call the A cost, which is the cost of sales versus the cost he's paying, is going down, which means that the longer the campaign goes, the less he's actually having to pay to get that click and and make that sale. And I imagine that, and this is Rich Bergman we're talking about. Rich Bergman, yes. So... I imagine that they click on this book, and then after they like this book, then it's it's bumping all the other books up as well, even if they're in slightly different categories. Is that correct? Yes, yes, except his are very different because of the age group. But yes, that's the theory that, yes, it would. And when you have a series, like I know you're planning to write a series, yeah. that makes it easier to sell the second book and the third book and the fourth book, because if they like your first book, it will pop up as you may like this. On yeah. the Amazon searches. It's also a lot easier to write the second book than the first book I'm really? finding out. Really? Now, yeah. th- now tell me why that is. So the first book took forever because um, I've written kids' books. I have been a journalist and written short articles. Uh, a full-length novel was brand new to me. And I went through a lot of the books on how you're supposed to do it. <laughs> And it just wasn't coming together. You know, I'd I'd go through and I'd list my characters and their backstories. I'd write their their long backstory. I'd write the scenes I wanted to use. I'd have their dialogue so I remembered who spoke in what way. And yet, when I went to outline, I'd have all these disjointed ideas that mm. I couldn't quite fit together. So, and because we we talk a lot about meditation, I meditated one day and the little internal voice that is me said, well, why don't you just sit down and write whatever scene comes to you that day? So I did Mm -hmm. that for the next few months and it started flowing. Nice. And there were scenes that I didn't end up using. And there was a lot of times that I was repetitive and I realized, oh, you know what? That person doesn't have privy to that information yet, so I need to change it. So it took a lot of Mm -hmm. extra time to rewrite, but using, you know, I was using Scrivener where I could rearrange the chapters easily. So then I could look at it and see and read where there's continuity errors and and things. And of course there's more, of course (laughs) there's more because I'm writing it out of order. But when I did that, not only did it flow, but I found that I got to know the character so well that I didn't have to remember Oh, that's who nice. Who spoke a certain way. In mm-hmm. fact, one of the things I did as an exercise was try to look online. It didn't have to be an actor or celebrity, but find somebody who sort of looked like the character. And so that I could kind of, and then I might say, well, they look sort of like that, but maybe a little more like this. And I'd have to get them so vivid in my head that if they knocked on the door, I wouldn't be surprised. Interesting. And so, you know, and then it, it, so it took years for the first part. And then suddenly it was very fast toward the end. Book number two, I'm a month in, and I've got 17,000 words wow. down. Wow, wow. And that's stopping to edit this book and make revisions and stuff as, as we need to. And I think because I took the time to set the characters, the setting, the outline, the backstory, even though it took forever to get it to sync once it was all together, now it's just like, oh, we're picking up where we left off. Now that's today. We'll see what happens <laughs> three months, but I'm noticing the flow is much faster. You know, when I work with authors, that is the one thing that I hear so much of, that they get out of the flow and they can't get back into it. And that's uh, gut-wrenching for a lot of them because they want to get it done, they want to move on, and it just doesn't go anymore. Particularly if you're like you and I and you have other obligations, you know, with with full-time projects that we're doing. So... I'm trying to get to the point where every single day, you know, you hear every writer out there who's been published numerous times say you need to write every day. Now, Mm -hmm. I do write every day for my job, but some of it's professional writing, not creative. So I'm trying to do something a little creative each day. You know, if I miss a day, I'm not going to beat myself up, but 
I can't go a month and then say, hey, let me pick up on my book because the flow is just not going to be there. Right. If I, you know, if more than a couple days goes by, then I'm looking at a blank screen thinking, where do I want to go from here? And, you know, it's interesting the way you say you know your characters so well. Um, I've actually edited books where the character name changes halfway. So have I. (laughs) And they say things that you start to realize, like, I'll say something, and I'm like, you know, I don't really think they would respond that way. Kind of like you know a friend who's going to get angry about something, and then, in the you know, you you can't write them being kind-hearted when you know, no, that would tick them off. Right, right. So one of the things I always read online is that one of the first rules of writing is show, don't tell. Yeah. So have you run into that, and how do you deal with that? I ran into that quite a bit on this first one because I tend to be really strong with dialogue. And so there's a tendency for me to say, you know, this happened and this happened, and here's why they're thinking that. And then when I want to fill in the backstory, so what I essentially did is I'll write a scene and I'll have the dialogue flow. But you've got people floating in midair. So then Mm. on the second pass, I would go through and say, here's what this person looks like. Here's what this person's wearing. Here's what the room looks like and kind of work it in so it doesn't look like. Um, and do it in a way that's not so distracting. Because have you read a book where there's dialogue and then there's five pages describing the room and you forgot what the conversation was about? Yes. So I was trying to intermix, like, the descriptions. And in my case, I used a lot of flashbacks. Mm-hmm. And one of the great feedback that actually came uh, from my husband was on the chapter heads, give them some point in time. Like I have an assembly. So he'll say, just Mm -hmm. say, you know, five months before the assembly, three days after it, so that when you flash back, you can show those stories, not tell. Mm -hmm. Because I read a lot of books where they say, oh, remember 10 years ago when we did this? Well, I would rather get a snapshot, a vignette of that action. Right. Um, And if you set it up right, people, I think, will go with you. Mm-hmm. And enjoy it more if you're if they're living that piece, even you know, versus trying to tell somebody. So I did a little bit of telling in the dialogue, but I tried to keep it at a minimum. Like if there was a way to show it, I was going to show it. Mm-hmm. So your book is a science fiction book. So how did you come up with the idea for it? And do you read a lot of science fiction? Is that one of your favorite I'm genres? St- I'm starting to. Okay. <laughs> What's funny is I, I was not, when this idea first came to me, this actually started like five years ago with the idea, idea popped in my brain. Mm-hmm. And my husband's the sci-fi fanatic. I was kind of like the cozy mystery. I thought the first book I'm going to write is a cozy mystery. Interesting. And then I had two ideas for a book, and I actually wrote down the synopsis. I posted on Facebook, here's my unofficial test, which one do you like? And the other one was also more fantasy-based. So mm-hmm. they both were. The, the other was a little more metaphysically minded. Well, I really shouldn't say that considering where this book is going. But <laughs> um, but this is a little more sci-fi. That's a little more um, uh, fantasy. I, I think in in that mm-hmm. regard. So where the idea actually came from was kind of amusing to me. So we had a cat, Katrina, and she's no longer with us. She lived a good life and, and died of old age. But she would come and really try to communicate with us. And she'd be like, meow, meow. <laughs> like, why can't you understand me? And we would, of course, meow back at her and then frustrate her because we're mean. <laughs> and, and I said to John, you know, we're making fun of her. She could be like trying to warn us the aliens are coming to get us because she had these really bright eyes like she was communicating. And I'm like, what if she's like secretly has cameras in there and she's collecting information and reporting back and she's trying to warn us of impending doom and we're like making fun of her. So that was the first flash for the idea okay. of the data collectors. And then I don't know if you've ever met people like this where they always have this deer in headlights look <laughs> like they're not quite normal okay (laughs) so i was thinking about a couple people i knew and i'm like you know they could be data collectors where they don't quite know how to fit in with the everyday they they're a similar species they look sort of like us but you know what if they're trying to help us and why would they be trying to help us and and so it kind of evolved from there and of course the dark side is well you know we're sending out all these messages to try to communicate with things out there 
what if there's some not so nice people out there who mm. maybe we don't want to alert them that we're here? Yeah. And so it kind of spiraled from that. So since I actually read the book, there are a few characters in there that you would I would say quirky. And how do you even come up with their like little quirks? Because it adds to the story. And a lot of times it would make me just smile and sometimes laugh because of what they were doing or saying, or you could picture it so vividly what they were actually doing. So characters like Roman, Mm -hmm. uh, Cepheus, and Ivan. I loved Ivan. (laughs) So we're going to start with Cepheus since he was the first He's not even the main character, but he was the first one that hit me, and this is where everybody will listen to the podcast. There's at least one time in an episode where you all think I'm crazy. (laughs) This is it. So I woke up one day, and I see, like, this figure, because I'm half asleep, Mm -hmm. posed on the dresser, and I assume it's our cat Bagheera, because he jumps and moves around things Mm -hmm. at night, and... um, And I kind of clear my eyes, and there's, like, nothing there. And somehow, Mm. in my half-lucid dreaming, you know, I'm imagining this almost this vampire-like creature with, like, this cape on and this beak nose and this sallow kind of expression, like, hunched over and looking at me. And it freaked me out. And so I I couldn't obviously wake my husband up and say, John, there's nothing in the room, but I just scared myself and I can't go back to sleep. (laughs) So I got up and I was literally pacing like I had this nightmare about this evil character. So in order to go back to bed, I convinced myself like, well, what if he's just misunderstood? Maybe he's a good character. Maybe something bad happened to him. And so I started this little storyline and I ended up falling in love with this character. He's one of my favorites Mm -hmm. because of his backstory and and how he got like that. And then I was able to go back to sleep. And I want to jump to Morphinae. Okay. Because the similar thing happened with her him. And you're going to find out the the shape shifting. Yeah. Um, Same thing happened, but this time with my vivid imagination, I'm half asleep and I see this yarn face, almost like if you imagine a Raggedy Ann doll crocheted, Mm -hmm. that's kind of what his hair looked like. And I see him popping up from the floor, almost like he's floating out of water and he's all blue and he's got like these black button eyes and he's not human. And I basically said to him, because he was like, looked like a him at, at that point, um, oh, are you a good character too? And I heard this really ominous voice in my head say, well, that depends on who you're talking to. Ooh. And it freaked me out because because the other one was clearly good. And this one was kind of like, it really depends on the situation. And you'll find out with this, you know, just like the physical form, good or bad, he's kind of a, a neutral face. Mm-hmm. So you kind of don't know what you're going to get. So tell me, before I tell you where Ivan came from, Tell me what you liked about his character. (laughs) Okay, well, I liked his resourcefulness with um, what he was able to invent, because this is Ivan the Tinkerer. And not only that, I liked his, uh, his just calm nature. I mean, it's like throw something at him and he just finds a solution to it and just goes right on ahead. You know, and I thought you'd pick this up right away because you know John, and and, uh, Ivan is the German name for John. So yes, when people say, am I in your book? My husband is in my book. (laughs) And he's a caricature of himself. And I wasn't sure how he was going to take to that, but he turned out to be incredibly flattered. And actually, now he quotes himself. (laughs) (laughs) But you have to take the normal quirkiness and multiply it by 100. Mm. You know, I, 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 within reason with him, um, with, with Lucine's character, with Fatima, who I also like, I, I feel like Fatima is my alter ego. She's very just jolly and just loves life. And I feel like I strongly relate to her. Um, Lucine, I felt like she started off a little too normal. And mm. I, I, I made the mistake of beginning with characters that I would like to be friends with. Interesting. And maybe that's fine for friendship, but it's boring to have people Mm. who are just too normal. Mm. So I'm like, what can I throw at them? (laughs) And so I had to almost take everybody's shadow side or negative side. It's like, how Mm -hmm. can I blow that way out of proportion? Mm -hmm. And that's how we got the vibrant characters that that you like. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they had to be likable. And, Mm -hmm. um, And most of them 
even the villains I kind of like. <laughs> well, and Roman. So yeah. some of the scenes that I found that I liked the best, there's a scene where Roman is in a bar. <laughs> and that is funny. It's touching. It's very vivid. I mean, it just was a great, great scene. It was one of my favorite scenes of the book. And that was one of the first ones I wrote. It was interesting. Two of the scenes that you picked out that you liked were are going to be in the beginning of the book. And then as I wrote the scenes, I realized they didn't fit and I had to rearrange mm -hmm. them. So Roman's an interesting character, and I can't say too much about him because without giving things away. But he's a researcher, and he does not want to be at this bar. It is to his great misfortune that he happens to be very tall and good-looking with striking eyes. So when he walks in, both men and women just congregate, and they want to be near him. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't want to be bothered. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he just wants dinner <laughs> and, and everybody to leave him alone so that he could observe and do research on human behavior without actually, by the way, having to interact with anyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, so, and, you, and his interactions are just so funny because he's researching human interaction, but he doesn't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> So he's served a dish, then he he's like, who did this? This is the most amazing dish. And he, as you had mentioned when you read it, mm -hmm. he falls in love with the dish, and he wants to know who's the chef who, you know, created it. And this little Fatima, who's like, he's really tall, she's really little, uh, you know, comes out of the kitchen, and he just immediately falls in love with her this mm -hmm. week. Mm -hmm. So he's somebody who never falls in love, but it seems like at the drop of a hat, oh, he's in love again. Mm -hmm. So he's just, a, he's a lot of fun. And he, he takes some, some really interesting twists and turns. And I honestly don't n remember how he came to be. Really? Yeah. He hmm. just, I was writing Fatima's character, and she's somebody who gives everybody the benefit of the doubt and tends to pick weirdos to yes. date as... Mm -hmm. Many of us in our younger years may may or may not have done, mm -hmm. and so I was picturing what what would she think is is quirky and fun, mm -hmm. and uh, it turned out to be him. <laughs> now, another thing that I enjoyed about the book is that there's a lot of comedy in it at times. You have a real knack for writing these scenes that you just funny. There's one where the main character is picking up vegetables off the ground <laughs> and it was so funny and at the same time things are happening like with her car that's stalled and it, it's just like a comedy scene so how did you come up with the sequence of that? Well because stuff like that happens to me <laughs> and I always find it funny when you're watching some sci-fi fantasy and the, the protagonist is like this gorgeous woman not a hair out of place and just can do everything perfectly so I'm like all right, I need to create somebody who's can be a bumbling idiot, you know, where she's dropping the vegetables, the door is slamming her in the butt. These are all things, you know, the, mm -hmm. the rain's coming down and she's got like mascara running down her face. These are things that happen to all of us. And I wanted her to be relatable because if she was so stinking perfect, mm -hmm. the women reading it are just going to be like, I don't like her. <laughs> <laughs> and the comedy is just the way I tend to look at life. When bad things happen, I will tell myself these little skits in my head, like this little internal comedy routine going around. Mm -hmm. In fact, I had the hardest time being dark, and I had a hard time making the evil characters being so evil. Like, I had to do things where you would hate them, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to get so graphic because I don't like a lot of violence. I Me don't too. like horror okay. movies. So I'm like, how can I convey this meanness, right. um, but do it in a way that it's not going to be so disturbing that when you're done reading the book, that's all you're going to think about. Mm -hmm. So on that note, it's kind of bittersweet because the show is going on hiatus for a little bit after mm -hmm. this episode, and this episode mm -hmm. was so much fun. So for my part, um, I am writing book number two and working with Cindy as my literary agent to market and publish and get the word out on the first book and then hopefully the series. And I'm also going to be one of three co-hosts on a new show, Doc Roger and Friends, The Bright Side of Longevity, with Dr. Roger Landry. And you can find out more about that. The website's still in production, but it's thebrightsideoflongevity.com. And you can find it on Spreaker and a 
bunch of other, wherever your favorite podcast is, that's where you can hear it. So that's going to take a little bit of my attention for a while. And Cindy is also going to be working on some different things. Can you tell a little bit about what you're doing? Well, I'm going to continue with publishing, helping people, and also... I hope to be doing some information, maybe on YouTube, maybe podcasts about the world of publishing and how people can help promote themselves. And you've been phenomenal in in helping me. A lot of the stuff you talked about, it takes a lot of time. And I could see people listening to this thinking, I I either don't have the technology skills to do what needs to be done, or I don't have the time. So where can people find out about you to hire you? Uh, SkinnyLeopardMedia.com. Thank you for joining us on Birdland Media Works. As a reminder, if you're seeking meditation, intuition, and mindfulness courses, visit birdlandmediaworks.com and click on the Online Resources tab. We also encourage you to visit skinnyleopardmedia.com to view their list of services.